Melbourne, and so good to have you back. And today we're continuing on a series that we started last week, talking about how Jesus is coming. And of course, for those who missed out, let me do just a quick recap so we know where we're traveling. In Matthew, of course, it talks a lot about how Jesus is planning his trip back, and who best to ask than Jesus himself? Matthew 24, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came in privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? Well, they've just been at the temple, and they're worried about it. And then they said, and what's the sign of your coming? And of course, the end of the age. And Jesus answered, watch out, no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. Well, we've had that over the years. Many have made wild claims and said, they are the ones that have got the answer. But Jesus says, no one deceive you. So today I encourage you to read the word and take hold of it to know exactly what is happening as we lead up to this time. We found last week that a lot of what Jesus was referring to, he said, go back to Daniel and just pick up the picture of it there. It says in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 11, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days, 42 months, equivalent to three and a half years. What's it all about? Well, when Jesus came, he came and ministered for three and a half years. And at the end of that, he brought an end to sacrifice. What was the temple built for? To bring sacrifices. He was the final sacrifice. So God had to stop people sacrificing. How to do that? Simple. Have the temple destroyed. Well, what's going to stop them rebuilding it? Oh, even easier. Put a mosque on it. And they can't rebuild. The Jews would love to rebuild the temple, but they can't because that's there. But see, what we've discovered over the process of time is people have come up with different ideas about how Jesus is going to return. And of course, Jesus makes it clear in Scripture he's coming back. But does he tell you which day? Does he tell you what the colour of the cloud he's riding on? And so people come up with all these different ideas, and there's two that I want to expose to you today. The first one's simply called a futurist view, which simply says that all of the issues in the Bible, like the persecutions, the tribulations, the pain, all that is going to happen in the future. Well, the other one says it's historicist, which means all through history, Christians are being suffering. So let me just track you through these things as we go through them. The little chart that I'm going to put up on your screen, hopefully you'll be able to read it there, is starting from 96 AD. Why is that? Because that's when the last book of the Bible, Revelations, was written. And they say, then from the writing of the scripture, we now need to live our life, which is called the church age. And it says that we roll through this church age until some time in the future, there's a secret rapture. What happens at this secret rapture? Well, Jesus comes and gets his people calls them all up out of the grave, all the ones that love him, shoot up into the sky, and they stay there for seven years. That sounds really great. Well, what else is happening? If the Christians are there, what's happening back on earth? Well, back on earth, there's this guy called the Antichrist, the beast. And he's there, and he actually talks to everyone and says, guess what? You're all going to follow me. We're going to have a great time together. So he then says, I've got a good idea. Let's rebuild the temple. Okay, sounds good. So they rebuild the temple and they start the sacrifices. But this Antichrist not only just sets up this rule on earth while the Christians are away, at that same time he identifies the way that he wants to be worshipped. And so suddenly, all of a sudden he's rebuilt the temple, but the temple has been destroyed and now they're unable to worship God, they're now going to worship him. At that time, the Bible talks about the seven seals, seven of trumps. There's all these seven bowls that have been poured out. These things are the punishments that are going to come. And that's during this Antichrist time. And it goes on from there. And it says, after that seven years, then Jesus is going to come back to the earth. And anyone who's come to the Lord, who's survived through the persecution and the tribulation, are going to be caught with him then. And then they're going to have that thousand year reign. So in short, what's it talking about? The thought is here that the Christians get taken out and the Antichrist is dealing with non-Christians. Well, 
nice thoughts, but I'm not sure we can find them in the Bible. Let's see what we can find about the people who come up with this historicist view. Again, same starting place, 96. And it says from there we go through the church age. But now it says that the church age from Jesus' day until Jesus comes back, that is the time of tribulation. And there's not one antichrist, but many antichrists. In fact, that's the time when the bowls get poured out, the trumpets, the, all those seals, all those things are broken there and all the pain happens. But someday, again in the future, because he hasn't come yet, Jesus is going to come back and everyone is going to see him, not just some. Everyone's going to see him. And he's going to be seen, be visible. The rapture word just simply means call up to meet him. And then it says he's going to come back, and I'm not sure why, but it says we're going to get a free ride to Jerusalem. Well, maybe it's the new Jerusalem, but I'd like to think I'm going to go over to the one over in Europe because that way I get a free ride. But we'll find out. And then it says the Armageddon. The Armageddon just simply means a gathering place. Well, what about the temple? Well, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. There's no need for it to get rebuilt because the sacrifices have ceased. And so all this journey from then to now, the Bible says to pick up our cross and carry our cross right up to the time where we actually meet Jesus and we stay with him forever. But of course, what about this Antichrist character? He doesn't seem to weigh very high in this thing. Well, let's go to what the scripture says in 1 John 4. And it says it like this. And in fact, the only places that the Bible mentions Antichrist is four times in the book of John. Never in the book of Revelation. Never in the New Gospels. This is any time. And this is how it describes the Antichrist. It says, but let every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus, uh, that does not that acknowledges Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. This was written somewhere back about 70, 80 AD. And John's writing and saying, already the spirit of the Antichrist is here. Well, will there be more? Will there be a big one? Will there? Oh, I don't tell you what the future is. All I know is that the Antichrist has been and probably will continue to mess up people. So let's go back to the book of Daniel and see if we can try and tie this together and help us understand, is any of these points right? Because remember, the Bible doesn't have pictures like we just used. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and it goes, And he will confirm a covenant with many for seven. And in the middle of the seven, he'll put an end of sacrifices and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end, that is decreed, is poured out on him. So we're going to come to and ask some of these questions then. Who is the he? He will confirm a covenant. Well, as far as the Bible says, the only people that confirm covenants is a God, not the devil, not an antichrist. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice. Well, Jesus ministered for three and a half years and he put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, it will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Interesting, in Hebrews, it tells us there that the curtain that divided the holy from the holy of holies was torn apart when Jesus died on the cross. That place was where they brought the final sacrifice offering into the Holy of Holies. Jesus is our Holy of Holies. Jesus is our sacrifice. He is the one that's taken us now from the outer court right into the presence of God. And so it says at the temple, he will put an end to it. He'll set up an abomination that causes it to be desolate. And now, of course, we know the Muslims have built their mosque there. And it will continue until the end is poured out. So let's try and put some of these pictures together. What's these 70 weeks and all that? Well, the 70 weeks, in one teaching, which is the, the uh, historicist view, says the 70 weeks goes right through, and the last week is the week of Jesus. Well, it says there that Jesus ministered for three and a half years. In the middle, he was cut off. He brought an end to sacrifice, an end to offerings, because he was the final offering. And then we don't know exactly the time, but some years later, not only did Jesus die, but then the disciples, they were the ones who were being chased for their life. In Acts 7, we find them fleeing to the hills. Acts 8, 
We find the deacons out preaching to everywhere because they've been chased out of the city. And so all of a sudden we see a real picture of what's happening there, of what's happening around the place. So that this teaching says that the one that brought an end to sacrifice was Jesus in the middle of the last week. And then after that, of course, within one generation, the temple was destroyed. And that means that Jesus in the future will be coming back. He doesn't need to go through any more tribulation periods or any of this because it's all happened. The other teaching, of course, is the futurist, which means that those things that have happened in the past have finished and stopped with Jesus. And then there's a big gap. And the last seven years are still going to happen. What's going to happen in the last seven? Well, someone's going to be the an Antichrist. And he's going to rise up and says, everything's really good. Until in the middle, he's going to build the temple after three years or three and a half years. He's then going to stop the sacrifice of the temple and says, you can't worship any other God. You've got to worship me. Well, I don't care which one's right, because one thing is we need to get ready for Jesus. There is a concern of some of these teachings actually make us turn away from what we're called to. So I want us to get to this picture. Let's go back, and we're going to continue on from last week, and we're up to Matthew chapter 24, verse 16. It says, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one in the housetop go down and take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back and get their coat. Well, I've heard many teachings say, When the Antichrist comes, you've got to get ready to run away and flee to the mountains. I actually read it that if I live in Judah, um, I actually live in Cranbourne. So that's not for me. It says, don't go down from your rooftop. Um, it's a bit cold for us to live on our rooftop or our house top. And so that's not written for us. It's talking about those people and it actually tells you very clearly, it's talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It says, how dreadful will it be in these days for pregnant women and nursing mothers, and pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on a Sabbath. Hang on. They teach that this is a seven-year time. Pregnancy doesn't go for seven years. Hmm. Nursing mums, well, some might keep them going that long. But hang on. Winter. I'd hate to think of a winter going for seven years. And a Sabbath. Um, seven-year Sabbath? I thought they were seven days. Goes on a little bit further in verse 21. For then there will be a great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never will be equaled again. If these days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, these days will be shortened. I don't know whether you see that. The persecution, the pain that's happening, the elect are there. And God says, I hate this. I want to bring it down. I want to change it. We're talking clearly about the temple getting destroyed and knocked down. It also says there, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah. Well, there he is. Do not believe it. For false messiahs, false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders. Hmm. Signs and wonders, are they a description of the coming of Jesus or are they a description of deception? They will deceive, if possible, even the elect the elect are still going through this. See, have I told you in advance? He's laying it out to his disciples. Get ready. We are not going to have just a simple run. We are going to have runs that push through to achieve what God has got. So if anyone tells you, don't listen to them. Because it says there, look, if anyone says, tells you this, he is out there in the desert, don't go out. Or he's in the inner room, don't believe it. You know, I've heard people say, oh, Come and listen to this great preacher because I'll give you a new revelation of God. I'll bring you into his presence. And I go, I thought the presence of God was the Holy Spirit. Yeah, good preachers are great. But that's not what it's about. It's about us living for him. This is a bit I really love here, verse 27. For as lightning comes from the east and is visible even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Wow, did you see that? So will be the coming of the Son of Man. We are not going to miss it. Like lightning flashes, everybody sees it. Let me tell you, when Jesus comes, it's going to be a bit of a lightning time. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. When? When he comes. Then will appear the sign. We're looking for the signs here under this tree and under that. And someone said this and someone 
video to cloud or someone saw a funny sky. <sighs> when he comes, you're going to see it. Then all the people of the earth will mourn. Whoa. Why will people mourn when they see the Son of Man? Is it because they should have repented? Today, if you're listening to this, and I'll ask you this question. If Jesus was to come back right now, would you be mourning or excited? Son of Man is coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Well, I can tell you this. If you love Jesus, it's going to be an exciting time. If you don't, you're going to be scared to hell. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. <laughs> Doesn't sound too quiet. He's going to send his angels with a loud trumpet call and he will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Heaven, of course, is another word for sky. It's an old English word for sky. So he'll just shoot across the sky and he's going to gather. So guess who's going to miss out? No one. If you love the Lord. Now learn this from the fig tree. As soon as the twigs become tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Hang on. Fig tree. What's that got to do? Why was it a pine tree? Gum tree would have been even better. Now fig tree, of course, speaks of Israel. Soon as you see something happening in Israel, you know that summer's near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Today we've seen many things. It says Israel will be restored to its land. It was, 75 years ago. You know, there's lots of things that are happening that gets us to know that we are seeing that happen. But when? Nobody knows the hour. I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things happen. Hang on a minute. Jesus was 2,000 years ago. That's a long generation. No, a generation's 40 years. Well, how do we know that? Well, it says that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, because of their sin and lack of trust of God, it said that that generation is going to pass away and the next generation will take on the inheritance. Forty years they waited for that generation to pass away so the new generation could take on. Today, it's no different. Jesus, he talks about it all the time. His tests in the garden, he had 40 days of fasting. 40 means a changing over from the old to the new, the old generation. Well, hang on, 2,000 years, 40 years, one generation. Well, let me tell you what happened within 40 years when Jesus said, he said that the temple would be destroyed and never be rebuilt. At 70 AD, Titus, one of the Roman rulers, he led an onslaught against Jerusalem. History tells us because uh, the Christians had to have fled but it was an incredible battle. They said that it was dead everywhere. They had killed more people in one day then than it had ever been. And they've got some incredible numbers. Of course, these are secular writings, so we think that they're correct. But these writings say that it was an incredible onslaught trying to annihilate all of the Jews at one time. The total city and, of course, the temple was pulled apart. And what happened, according to their history books, say, that as they burnt the temple, they discovered that inside certain sections of the bricks, there were golden plates and things like that. And as it burnt, the gold melted. So what did they do after the fire finished? They pulled all the bricks apart to pick out every piece of gold. And as Jesus said, not one stone would be left on another, just as was said. Now, but that goes on and says, but... Now we're changing it. Remember they asked the question in the beginning. When's the temple going to get destroyed? When are you coming back? When's the end? But then it goes on. But the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man. Do you know, people have tried to predict when Jesus is coming back. And you know what? They just get more wound up and look more stupid every time. We've got to make sure we don't get caught on those things. The question is, what are we going to do? Well, it goes on and tells you what we should be doing. As it was in the day of Noah, verse 37, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Let's get it together. Just like Noah, it's going to be the same when Jesus comes back. For in that day, before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving and marrying, going to football, having picnics, going out for a drive, checking out the drive in theatres, going shopping, until the day Noah entered the ark. I know I added a few there. But they just were living life. They couldn't care less about the things of God. Noah's busy building a boat. Could be a bit like many of us 
busy building our lives, building the church, training our families. We're preparing for the future. And the world goes, oh yeah, they don't care. They knew nothing about it. Even though they could see something happening, they knew nothing about it until the flood came and took them all away. Let's go on. They don't, I'll just read that to you. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be when the coming of the Son of Man. I want you to get that picture. This is how. So parallel, Noah, Jesus, flood, return. So let's try and put these words together and understand. So flood is the event. The return is the event. And so when it comes back, there's going to be two groups of people. There's the righteous and the unrighteous. The righteous, they got a boat ride. The unrighteous, got a quick wash. When Jesus comes back, what's going to happen to the righteous and righteous? Well, let's read once more to see if we pick it up. When the flood came and it took them away. Who got taken away? The sinner did in the flood because they were not responsive to God. So when the call went out to say, come and gather here, they weren't there because they were doing their own thing. This is how it's going to be when the Son of Man comes. Let's continue reading that same passage because this is where people build incredibly weird, strange doctrines. It goes on, verse 38, Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing until the flood came and took them away. Who was taken away? The sinners. Well, two men will be in the field, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. A lot of people say, which one? Which one? Well, Noah, which one was taken? The sinner. Which one inherited the earth? The saint. Where are we going to be, or where are we going to be positioned with Jesus? Well, for some reason, we're going back to Jerusalem. And then after that, we get the new Jerusalem, the new earth, and all those extra things that go with it. But today, I want us to see this clear. It's not about, will someone disappear on me? No, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for you. You don't have to worry about what else is happening around. It's not that. It's the others that are going to be left, that are going to stand and take the goodness of God, just like Noah did. So this is the point we've got to remember, though. Verse 42. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know the day your Lord will come. You must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Isn't that great? So he's popping up one day, and if you're ready, you've got to get a free ride with him. If you're not, you're going to be really upset. How do you get ready? Well, there's a couple of things. One, you've got a relationship with God. You need that. If you don't have that, contact us as soon as you can, so we can help you. But if you do love the Lord... Then there's a call to be faithful. Verse 45 says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at a proper time? Let's try and translate that to a bit more. Who then is a good person who loves God? Somebody who is actually helping others grow in the things of God, helping in their family, helping them in their marriage, helping them become the all that God has planned them to be. That is a faithful, good servant that we need to see. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Oh, I reckon God's going to go, well done. I always joke about this. Jesus can come back in the middle of one of my sermons any day because at least I'm going to be doing something good for that minute. Hmm. We should be doing something good for all of our minutes. We need to do it. Verse 47, truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So the whole story of Jesus coming is not to cause pain, not to worry about the tribulation, the wars. It is simply to prepare us for the blessings he's got. And when is he going to come? I just want to take you back to the simple verse. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. When we as Christians do our job, as we're able to respond to how God wants us to live our lives and to express who we are in Christ, that testimony, we're preparing the way. Just like John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus the first time. Today, we, the church, are the ones preparing the way. That's why at Turning Point, we are linked up very strongly with the CRC churches across this world now. 
was started originally by a couple of guys meeting together in Ballarat some 75 years ago. Now we have churches and Bible schools and schools and ministries in over a hundred nations. And we're at Turning Point, we feel exactly the same. We want to be committed to this. In fact, the CRC has put a challenge out to us to have a presence, a CRC presence in every nation of the world. That's 256 of them, we think. And so in that 256, what are we doing? Well, as you know, as a Turning Point Church, we've been involved in working in areas of Papua New Guinea and the islands and India and all those different areas. And lately we've been involved very strongly in Africa. And that's where I'll be heading over to see. Over there we've set up many Bible colleges with the sole purpose of training up men and women for ministry. And in doing that, we're looking to see them to encourage and change the world. Well, I wanted you to pray because I'll be heading off very soon to visit a number of these, stations, of these countries. We're going to start off in Uganda, Kenya, then head off to Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, South Africa, into Angola, then Congo, Zambia, then Mowali, and of course into Mozambique. Well, yes, there's a lot to say, and there's thousands of kilometres of travel. So pray for us as we go. We can't go to the other ones that we've identified there, and Zimbabwe, and South Sudan, and Ethiopia, and Mauritius, and Botswana, and Libya, and Ghana, and Sierra Leone. But we will. I believe in it. Through the grace of God, we're going to impact every nation in Africa. That's my challenge to us as a group of churches. Turning point, can we do that? Because, see, Jesus says that the gospel is preached to all the world, then I'll come. Again, I want to just leave you with this one verse of scripture. Sometimes people get scared when they think about Jesus coming and are they ready? Well, this is simple. You get ready with God and this is what's going to happen. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangels and the trump call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so will be with the Lord forever. Did you see that? And so we will be with the Lord forever. Today, I don't want anyone missing out. Jesus doesn't want anyone missing out. He's coming back for a victorious church. But we need to get people into the kingdom of God. May I encourage you, if you don't know you, Jesus, get in contact with us. Other than that, may I encourage you to share Jesus as we prepare ourselves for his coming. Bless you, Lord.